Hey. Hello, hello. How are you doing? Good. How are you? Can you hear me okay? Yes, ma'am. Can you hear me all right? I can. Perfect. We are in business. How's it going? Good, good. How are you doing? I'm good. Did you watch the fights last night? I haven't had a chance yet. I literally got a call from a friend who was like, hey, can you come help me? My toilet's broken. So I had to stop everything I was doing and go help him install a new toilet at his house, um, which is fine because it was a fight of the week or it was a fight pass. So I can just go back and rewatch it, which will be good. But um, I honestly kind of forgot about it. But I I mean, you can tell me what happened because it's not going to hurt my feelings. But I was <laughs> thinking Cheeto, I was thinking Cheeto was going to take that fight. And I haven't looked to see what ended up happening. Oh, for real? Yeah, yeah. I, I only watched the end of the Holly Holm fight and then I watched the main event. So I didn't even watch the whole thing because I forgot about it, too. Because I feel like sometimes they don't really like market the fight nights as much, even though it was a yeah. great fight. Um, so I kind of forgot about it. I'm like, oh, yeah, there's fights on tonight. So when I got home, I was like, immediately turned it on. But yeah, San Hagen actually won and he he kind of dominated the fight, honestly. Um, yeah. So it went to decision and there was a couple rounds that like you could probably say were close. But for the most part, I feel like San Hagen pretty much dominated every round, in my opinion. Um, they, did, they did five. Yep. They gave him two. Oh, man. Yep. He does look so good <laughs> recently that I just. Yeah, I didn't see that going to a decision. Yeah, he well, he is impossible to finish. So I knew if Sanhagen was going to win, that he would probably win by decision. But I had a feeling like, oh, maybe Cheeto could pull off like a submission or a knockout or something like that, because he does have some power and yeah. his grappling is amazing. So I was yeah. like, huh, that's crazy. Like I had a feeling Sanhagen was going to win. And I even said it on my podcast the last time that I thought he's going to win. Dang. <laughs> but I was like, I don't know. I love Cheeto, though. So I'm like, I want both of them to win. <laughs> yeah. Who ended up winning the Holly home bout? Holly. Good for her. It's nice to see her still out there and kicking it. She's 41. She's seeing, I mean, there was just that period of time where, like, it seemed like Rhonda was literally – she was like the female Conor McGregor, but without yeah. the heel aspect. And then you, she just comes in there and just straight right. Or I don't even remember if it was a, sh a was right or left. It was a sh oh, that's right. She got head yeah. kicked. Yeah, yeah, it was a head kick. Which was surprising because Holly was like this super boxer. So everyone just thought, oh, well, they're just, Rhonda's going to, she's going to manhandle her and fight stayed on its feet. It was crazy. There's insane. been so many good fights, like even last week or two weeks ago, whenever it was with Leon and Kamaru, and then Jones coming back. It, it just seems like Crazy. it's been nonstop good action. And then in just a couple of weeks, we got Pereira and Adesanya again, and that'll be awesome. Oh, yeah, that's right. That is coming up. Yeah, I think it's like April 14th or something. Um, so he's the 26th. So it's like two weeks, three weeks from now. Nice. I'm excited for that. Yeah. I I don't know who man, it's hard to really pick against Adesanya, but I don't know. Pereira's so good. He does seem to have something that Izzy can't seem to get past. And I was right. you know, I, I like to look into like what did these people do before this? Because when I found out that Volk was a two hundred and four pound rugby player and he's fighting in like the one thirty to one forty range, uh, it just what? Yeah. So I had to do some more research, and I guess Pereira, he walks around at like 240 when he's not in camp. When he gets to camp, he shows up at around 220, and then they fight at 185. So he's cutting like 60 Huge. pounds. Yeah, so he's he's obviously a very big guy because he's got the same height, but he's walking around at 260. And if you go back and you look at Adesanya with his fight against um, uh, Blahovich, he didn't even – he didn't even get up to the 205. He weighed in at like 202. And so he's just, but he's got, he's got skills. That's why he's a style bender. Yeah, exactly. I've always I been a big excited. fan of his. Yeah. But it's so exciting to see somebody cross over from another sport. And I think that's what makes Pajara so exciting to watch because he had a really successful kickboxing career. And it's like, okay, you know, can you, can you do the same thing in MMA? Maybe we'll see. Yeah. Um, 
The one thing I don't know much about, like his grappling skills. I mean, he's Brazilian, so I assume you know he's been training <laughs> some jujitsu. But yeah. um, and I mean, if you're in Brazil, you can train with the best of the best. So I don't know. I don't. I haven't really seen much grappling from him. I guess I need to go back yeah. and watch some of his older fights, but. Um, that would be the only thing I feel like that could limit his career would be, would just be maybe like a really good wrestler, um, could, could really to, be a problem for him. Seems to be a big problem amongst these elite strikers. And like, I think that was the biggest thing that we saw with Cyril is he, he's a phenom- he moves well, he strikes well, but once you get your hands on him, he can't really escape. Yep. And when Nganu did it to him. And Jones now did it to him, and that's a that's a huge flaw. Um, so much of the UFC, like I can remember when I first started watching UFC back in, like I was probably twelve or thirteen years old, watching some of my first fights, and you're seeing people like Tito and uh, Shamrock and and Chuck and all these all these guys that are Hall of Famers essentially. It was a lot of just striking, and then ground and pound but it wasn't really jujitsu and now you get too close to someone they'll rip your arm out so uh it's completely changed the game and i think i think Pereira is big enough that if he i think he could do what blahovitz did to izzy which is because he has the weight he can weigh in at 185 he can put back on 15 to 20 pounds and then lay on izzy if he had to yeah and just but we'll see it i mean do you think that was an early stoppage in that fight? Because he looked pretty wobbled and his head kind of dropped. And I, yeah, I, I thought it was a fair enough stoppage. I thought it was pretty fair. I mean, I guess I understand sometimes when it's a title fight, why people might get a little irritated if it stopped a little bit early. Because it's like you yeah. want him to just go to the death, basically. But right. um, but yeah, I mean, like in general, like I thought it was pretty fair. I think... Um, I think it's good that they're doing the rematch, though, like just to kind of clear that up. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I didn't really think it was a huge deal. I thought he was going to lose regardless. So I don't know. Yeah, I I know that right now they're trying to put together this uh, this Chandler and Connor fight for because of the whole the UFC show. But man, I would I'd pay the 89 bucks to watch him fight Diaz again. <laughs> I would, too. That. That fight was so interesting because it was like Diaz was not supposed to win that fight. <laughs> no, like he was not supposed to win, and he's not really like he doesn't win all the time. You know, like he's not no. the most consistent guy. But sometimes, just you get matched up with the right person, and I don't know. It it just shows that like styles make fights for sure. Yeah. Do you remember a couple months back when Leon Edwards and uh, Diaz fought and he got him with the Stockton slap and instead of going in for like the kill he just points at him like I got you mother effort <laughs> you know I would have taken you down if I wanted to like yeah, that's just that's how he is those guys yeah. yeah and it's funny because Diaz like he can do something like that in a fight and he's basically won the fight because he has such a loyal fan base that no matter what he does, they're going to be like, oh, well, he basically won the fight because, you know, yeah. <laughs> it's so yeah. funny. Yeah, the, him and the Tony Ferguson fans, people who love the Kukui, they just love him. Oh, yeah. Uh, there, there's there been so many good ones. Like even the Gaethje um, co-main last week was incredible. Gaethje seems to just be. He surprised yeah, me, honestly. He surprised me. He was a lot more patient, I feel like, than he normally right? is. Right? I think yeah. that that was big, especially like, you know, he had that Chandler fight where it was three rounds of, hey, we're going to just kill each other for three rounds. And then the Oliveira fight, and you kind of look at it and you're like, man, how did how did that happen? But I don't know. There, there's so many names, especially in that lightweight division. That lightweight division is oh crazy my gosh, right now. It is lightweight and bantamweight right now are just crazy. Right, I've and everyone's kind of got their eye on that next weight class because they're all cutting. You got Aljamain talking about going up and fighting. Um, you got what's Mahashiv talking about going and fighting 170. Leon, you got now Kamza is saying he wants to fight at 185. So uh, there's guys that are moving up because they see the opportunity there. And it's really weird 
seeing these guys that have been just dominating for like two years finally lose because yeah. <laughs> it's it's like a completely new meta now within the ufc it's pretty cool it is and like, it's interesting for yeah, sure and i i do like watching some of the other ones but i don't know the way that the ufc just sets it all up to me it's like iphone versus android there's like the UFC is the iPhone of mixed martial arts. <laughs> and then all these other things are just different Android platforms. It's like you got Motorola UFC or you got one pride K one, like all these different things that are all doing variations of the same, but they're still good. It's just, I prefer the iPhone. <laughs> right. That's a good way to look at it. Actually. I never thought about it that way. And like, I, I even watch Bellator sometimes. I don't watch it consistently. Not like I do the UFC, but, um, yeah, I mean, you, you definitely see a difference. And there is a lot of talent in Bellator. I don't think they're quite at the level of the UFC yet, but I think maybe one day they will get there, especially as, you know, more fighters like Nganu left. And, um, you know, fighters are, are kind of like getting a little annoyed with some things. So <laughs> I think yeah. some fighters will start kind of going over to Bellator and PFL and other organizations. But until that happens then I think the UFC is still just going to be the top of the, the top of the heap for sure. Yeah. And they've still got room to grow. I mean, there's only like seven weight classes for men. And I think there's only four for women right now, three or four for women. And in boxing, they break it down way further, you know, with cruiser weights and, you know, different variations there. There's so many places they can go with it by opening up more weight classes, bringing people that, it's just, it's been really cool. And what was really awesome is during the whole pandemic, when that all started, all these other sports weren't doing anything, but I could turn on UFC and watch it every single weekend, pretty much for all of 2020 and 2021. And it was no different other than just less people yelling in the crowds. Yeah. But still just the same sport, nothing had to change about it. And that was cool. They, they did a good job through that all. I know. I, I couldn't even believe how many events they put on during, during COVID. It was kind of crazy. And the way that yeah. they like created their own bubble and like did all that stuff and all the testing yeah. and man, like all the hoops they had to jump through to be able to do that. It's just like, wow. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. Well, Dana's been, Dana's put a good group of people around him. It seems like, and on top of that, he's obviously got pretty good business acumen. So it's, yeah. I just see it continuing to grow. Like, I don't see at this point with how big it's gotten that it's going to get to a point where it seems like the NFL and Major League Baseball and basketball are getting to where the bubble's just kind of like at its max capacity. And now its only option is to deflate or pop. Right. So we'll see. I, I'm going to keep watching. I, I'm hoping that one day they sell something like the NFL sells the Sunday ticket where I can just pay 500 bucks and get all the fights for the whole year or something like all the pay-per-views. Yeah, that's a great idea, actually. I'll pay for it all. I don't care. <laughs> yeah, that would be cool. You'd probably save a lot of money that way, too. And I'm going to watch all the fights anyway, so might as well. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, no, I, I'm really excited about it, too. I think what's really cool about MMA is that it's an individual sport. So there's no teams. There's no, you know, there's not all that um, added aspect to it that other sports have. And it also kind of makes each fighter like has their own like brand in a way. And I think yeah. that's really cool. Uh, and they'll have their own styles. And there's just so many possibilities because there's so many fighters and now that the women's MMA is growing and a lot of people are starting to get into training jujitsu and wrestlers are starting to come to MMA. It's really, yeah, it's really exciting. I'm, yeah. I'm excited to see uh, the wrestling uh, kind of get more popular, like wrestlers coming from like Penn State and, and that. And we've had a few yeah. in the past, but it seems like more are starting to kind of look to MMA now. Well, shoot, Bo Nickel looked like a future champion couple weeks ago i he was impressed came in there he i know the guy was i forget who he was fighting again but he was saying that there was like an illegal knee to the groin or something right before that takedown that ended the fight yeah. and i went back and watched it it did hit near the waist but like he dom he manhandled that fight and he he's really good <laughs> i've went back and watched some of his like 
events where he's wrestling Gordon, um, Gordon Ryan, for those of you who are listening, give him a Google. <laughs> uh, and he's beaten Gordon. So like, and I understand it's not like necessarily a belt event or something like that, but dude, Gordon is a huge guy and yeah. he's and he's incredible on steroids. At <laughs> yeah. And he talks about it. He's, he's all about Which it. Which is and, fine. I mean, he's not really breaking the rules. I don't think. Are there no. rules against that in ADCC? I don't think there are. I don't I think there I could be wrong, but. Well, I mean. There might be in the future if, if more people came to it. He's pretty open about it. So if there was a rule, I think. Yeah, I don't think he would be competing if there was. Yeah, I don't think they're doing the Tour de France thing where everyone's doing it, but no one's talking yeah. about it. I think everybody knows that they're doing it and they're so okay too. with it. Because like, what? Out of all the sports, like, yeah, you're going to get messed up getting kicked and punched and stuff. But jujitsu, you have, like, the highest likelihood of completely having almost, like, dismemberment. Your yep. ligaments, tendons, everything being torn. A little bit of growth hormone, a little bit of testosterone that helps rebuild that muscle and and helps with, it, like, mTOR. All that stuff is just going to be incredible for those guys. So if it lets them do it, they, right. and they all know, why not? Yeah, well, and it's also a sport that you can compete in, you know, a little bit older, too. Whereas MMA, yeah. you kind of, once you get in your 40s, it's like, yeah, you're kind of done. But with jiu-jitsu, I mean, you're not taking so much damage in, you know, getting punched in the face. So yeah. <laughs> I feel like your career longevity, like there's more potential there, too. Although a lot of, I feel like a lot of like the bigger guys, they do, you know, retire usually yeah. See, how old was Lovato? He he recently retired this year. I don't know how old he was. He Got to be at least in his forties. Yeah, I mean, but you hear and like people like are all over the internet now talking about they're doing jujitsu. They're doing jujitsu, and you see guys like Jocko, who's fifty something, fifty six, and he's still rolling around. Yeah. And, <laughs> him and all his buddies you got joey diaz talking about doing jujitsu and i'm like dude if joey diaz can do it then anybody can do it um and yeah there's levels to it but it's really it's it's that battle i've been wanting to do jujitsu i live far outside of a place where they have something that's like for adults but i just found out that they're putting in a jujitsu place about 15 minutes from where i live nice. i'm thinking that might be good for for me with like rehab and stuff that is not like flexibility but also just like a workout so yeah definitely I'm, I'm, fingers crossed that actually happens because if it does i'm definitely gonna sign up and get going on it i did Absolutely. taekwondo when i was younger but never never done that that's a whole nother crazy i took one jujitsu class and then and i was training boxing at the time too like pretty regularly like three four days a week and i took one jujitsu class and I was like, I'm gonna get addicted to this. So I'm not gonna I'm not gonna start this right now. <laughs> I need more time. <laughs> I was like, this will be my new personality for like the next year if I start this <laughs> now. And I'm like, I don't need another obsession. I don't have time for this. Cause I was about to open my insurance agency at the time. Oh, and nice. I was <laughs> which I just left, but uh, but at the time that was my focus, was my career. So I was like, yeah, I don't know if I want to add another thing that I'm going to be obsessed with right now, but I'm like, I'm going to come back to this because I love this. This is cool. Yeah. This is different. This is not like anything else I've ever like done before with like fitness. So I'm like, one day I'm going to start that chapter in my life. I'm like, sorry, right now I'm going to focus on boxing right now. <laughs> but yeah. Uh, I, yeah. And then once I opened the agency, boxing went out the window because I was up to my ears. But, <laughs> uh, yeah. but I want to get back into it. Like I hit the bag the other day and I'm like, man, I miss doing this. I really miss doing it. It's so fun and it's great cardio and it's just a good way to like get your stress out. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's a, a super underestimated uh, cardio activity is like, kickboxing classes or even just boxing having someone a boxing trainer and just taking the classes and using it for your cardio i hung a <clears throat> i hung a heavy bag in my basement and i'll go down there and i'll just try to do like two minute rounds and where you're bouncing on your toes throwing jabs i'm dead at the end of two minutes like if i'm actually putting anything behind a punch or a kick and 
trying to stay on my toes and bouncing, that's that's a rough two minutes. I might as well be I might as well be trying to run on the treadmill at like nine, ten miles an hour. That's how it feels. It really does. And it also like makes you really sore. <laughs> like if you haven't yes. done it in a while and if you're really like throwing everything into your punches, then the next day you're like, oh my goodness. Like your arms are sore, your back is sore, your legs are sore. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh my goodness. Yeah. But it's so fun. So what yeah. what uh so you hit the heavy bag once in a while. What what does your training routine look like? So right now it has been not as good as I would like it to be, but <laughs> I, and that's mainly because I'm dealing with a back problem. So I messed up my back and I don't, there isn't like an injury date. Um, I just slight backstory that we can come back to. I used to be really, really overweight, like 420 something or so pounds. Um, and that put a lot of stress on my body. So I go into the doctor because I'm having issues with my leg. Turns out I've got like degenerative issues in my back. So I'm getting injections and doing traction and it's cut back on my working out from seven days a week to like three days a week right now, just to be careful. But I, I built an entire gym in my basement. So I have oh, a nice. full, yeah. So I built a full gym down there. Um, so that way I never have an excuse not to work out, which I'll still make excuses to not go to my basement <laughs> and work out. But I like, I, I do like traditional bodybuilding type lifting. And the reason is, is those people are the professional football players of weightlifting. Like yep. they are, whether you, whether you envy that body style or not, they are the most efficient and effective fat loss and muscle growth people in the entire world. So I studied them. I bought like Arnold's Encyclopedia of Bodybuilding. I'm buying like Chris Bumstead's workout plans and Julian Smith and like all these people that just have incredible physiques studying it and then putting together my own routine out of it. So it started with like a three day split. And then usually every two to three weeks, I try to add in a new day and just refine it down further and further. So eventually I try to get to like a single body part for 30 to 40 minutes at a time. Um, so like it might start with chest and light shoulders and eventually just get to chest and just shoulders where I'm putting in hundreds of reps just in the, that one area, getting every part of it worked. Because to me, that's like the best, that just terrible burn, but incredible feeling. Interesting. Yeah. I, I love getting a good pump. That is like the best feeling. And I feel like I've kind of like changed my style over time, kind of as I've evolved. And since I actually got my personal training certification and like kind of went through all that and kind of had to force myself to learn more about just like how the human body works and all the science. Yeah. And and I've I've been studying bodybuilders too, because you're right. They they know how to build muscle, they know how to build aesthetics, and they're just the best at it. And they kind of knew all this stuff before the science really came out. And now we're like, oh, they were right. <laughs> yeah. They were right. So yeah. it's interesting for sure. Yeah. Um, and like, just personally, a workout for me is not just, I'm just trying to build muscle. It's therapy for me in some ways. I, I take, and like, I, side note, big fan of men, like just cognitive therapy in general, like going and seeing a therapist and talking to someone because you can't just take everything out on the weights. But if I'm wrestling with an issue, if I can wrestle with something physically while wrestling with it mentally, I can just really hone in there. And when I'm alone and have that private time working out alone, it's like, okay, this is, it's, it's cathartic. It's just, it's really good for me personally. And clients, friends, family, everyone says the same thing when they actually give it a try. That's the hard part 100%. is giving it a try, right? Yes, 100%. And that is one thing that I feel like has sort of impacted my training lately is sometimes I'm training to be optimal and I'm training to try to build, you know, muscle, build the best physique, build my flexibility, mobility, and I'm so focused on just like I guess, you know, the the details. And then sometimes I'm like, I just really want to do this for my mental health right now. I don't really care about the results necessarily or being optimal. So like I'll go through these little phases where like 
you know, for a couple months, I'll be trying to just be optimal and I'm training and I'm really like putting intention into every single workout. And then I'll be like, let me just kind of freestyle it today. Like, let me just do what I feel like doing. Let me do the exercises that I want to do. And yeah. it's because it's good for my brain. <laughs> it's good for my mental health. And yeah, it, it's it's funny. Like just there's so many reasons to work out that I truly don't even understand how I could stop working out at this point because there's yeah. so many benefits that I see from it. Yeah. Do you, and I'm sorry to ask you a question. How, um, when you work out, like how long are your workout sessions? Are they long, like hour, two hours, or are you in and out quick? No. So if I'm in a hurry, I'll try to keep it under an hour or like 45 minutes if I absolutely have to. But for yeah. the most part, I usually don't give myself like a time limit. Sometimes I'll be in there for 45 minutes to an hour. Sometimes I'll be there for two hours. Um, I do sometimes rest a lot in between sets too if I'm doing kind of heavier stuff um, mm -hmm. or if I'm moving up in weight and I feel like a little exhausted. <laughs> yeah. If I'm trying to hit a PR or something, I'll make sure to give myself enough rest in between. But yeah, it, it really just depends. But I would say for the most part, on average, it's usually around 60 to 90 minutes I'm in the gym. Yeah. Anywhere wanna... from three to six days a week. <laughs> I want to build back up to that. Um, and I'm hoping over the course of this year, I'm able to get back to whatever this new normal is going to be. The way that I have to work out now completely changes for the rest of my life with trying to avoid surgery. Um, right. so with having like a disc injury, it's not going to get better. Really. I've already gone in and had injections that are supposed to make it better and it didn't. So now at this point, it's like, okay, I have to take a huge step back and I have to look at myself. Like I'm starting at 400 pounds again. So let's, that's how I kind of have to mentally approach it is I'm starting from ground zero and I have to build a completely new routine. And that's been a challenge just because it's like, I know what I was doing and now I can't, but I want to do that again so badly. And I'm just like, all right, Hey, it's there. Just work towards it again, work towards it again. And that's been my aim is just trying to get, get it back in a good place. But I, like you said, I don't, I don't think I would be an enjoyable person to be around if I did not have exercise. Same. And I can tell you that because I know when I'm not working out as often as I was, I'm not as happy as I as I used to be. And I don't mean that I'm an unhappy person. I just mean like if I don't have something to wrestle with physically, then I'm going to wrestle with it mentally. And that's yep. going to – that's taking your demons with you everywhere. <laughs> it is. And I feel like – I don't know. I feel like for me, it's mostly like the confidence aspect of it, I think. And just feeling like not even how I look necessarily. I mean, that definitely helps. Like when you look and you see you're growing your muscles a little bit, you're like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, the actual like confidence that it gives me of accomplishing something and making progress, that to me is the biggest thing. Cause like when you see yourself, like sometimes I'll go back and like watch my old videos that I made of like my workouts and I'm like, oh my gosh, those weights were so light. What was I doing? And yeah. then and then I look now, I'm like, man, look how much progress I've made. That's crazy. And you can make progress in so many different ways. You can make progress with your strength. You can make progress with the size of your muscles. You can make progress with losing weight. You can make progress with gaining weight. You could, yeah. I mean, there's just, there's so many different things that you can do that um, will give you like a little sense of achievement. And that to me is the biggest thing that it does is just gives me that sense of achievement that I got something done. I did something difficult. I got it done and I'm getting better every single time. Like it's so yeah. cool. So cool. I so, agree 100%. <laughs> yeah. It, it's honestly, yeah, I could not live without it. I really could. <laughs> <laughs> I would be a mess. Yeah. But uh so you specialize in weight loss. Um yeah. and are you doing nutrition and fitness? Are you doing just nutrition? Are you doing how do you, how do you kind of go about that? Yeah. So I work on three different areas. Habit, lifestyle, I kind of group into one thing. Um 
fitness is the other side and I just call it exercise and activity. Um, because a lot of people are just so inactive that you just got to start by like, Hey, let's just not sit down for it for six to eight hours a day. Why don't we just have an every hour on the hour activity just to get you up and move in to start. So, and then nutritionally, um, I focus a lot of what I do because now here's the thing. I preface everything that people are going to hear in this by understand this first. I work with people who specifically need to lose 50 plus pounds of weight because it's a completely different strategy. If you're 50 yes. plus pounds overweight, like one, you can lose weight a lot faster. And two, there's probably some other stuff going on in your life that got you up to being 50 plus pounds overweight because like it's not 20, 30 pounds. You get up 20, 30 pounds. You can just do like a slow cut, but if you're 50 plus pounds overweight, we really got to, we got to approach some aspect of this semi-aggressively to get you back in check. So for me, I did things that were way too aggressive. Um, and I say that only because if I were to try to ask a client to do that, it would, their failure rate would be a thousand to one. Um, but I, I center a lot of my nutrition around fasting. And because I'm working with men, it's it's more of I'm trying to teach them discipline and discipline through fasting, um, specifically like telling you, telling yourself no in a world that like has so many yeses available to you. Like if you can learn to be in control of your own body, then all the things that are not in your control outside of you seem insignificant. So everything kind of ties in together, the habit lifestyle choices, the nutrition choices, the exercise choices. And it's all based on like a progressive overload system of we're going to we're going to slowly ramp this up over a six month period and try to build you a lifestyle that then after six months that you've built, that lifestyle is hopefully maintainable. Um, and then if you fall off the wagon, well, you just start back at ground one and at, at this first step and you work your way through it again. When I started everything, it was all about how can I teach somebody to be their own personal trainer so they never have to hire someone. So you hire me one time, I give you everything that you need. I essentially turn you into your own personal trainer. I educate you literally on kinesiology. I educate you on nutrition. I educate you on how to do your own research, what websites are good, what websites are bad. Try to put the best resources available in your hands. And then send you on your way and hope that you're able to um, to keep replicating it. I don't want someone glued to me. That means I did a bad job. That's super interesting. So, I actually really like that approach to it because I think a lot of people want that. I think a lot of people want to know how to do it themselves. Um, like I, I'm kind of one of those people. Like I've never I mean, I've had like handful of trainers in like group settings but i've never like had like a personal trainer because i was like oh i can't afford that I, I just always thought it was like the most expensive thing ever for some reason <laughs> until i actually like got into it i'm like oh it's really not that much <laughs> but yeah. um but i've never really like had a trainer i've always just had friends that were like really into fitness and i learned a lot yeah. from them and then i kind of branched off and like went into like youtube and just kind of delved into like different bodybuilders and um you know people like jeff nippert i've learned a lot from and, and just yeah. stuff like that and i just really i don't know i like being able to just go to the gym and that be my time and i feel like that's kind of what it is for a lot of people is like they just want that to be their time because that's when you know maybe you had a bad day the the day before and that's where you're dealing with it and you know, obviously, you know, there, there are other ways to deal with your problems too, but I feel like, yeah, when I go to the gym, that's my time. Um, yeah. and, and that's, that's, that's really cool that you're doing that because, um, it, it is also like a very emotional journey. I would feel like when you're having to lose that much weight. Yeah. Huge. That's why I got really into like psychology and got really into the habit. Like I got credentialed in behavior change. Um, because when I, I noticed that diet and exercise isn't hard, it's it, it, more so than like the weight loss is the easiest part of this because realistically, say you, 
say you need to lose 100 pounds. And let's just say that it takes you 18 months to lose your 100 pounds. So you do it at a pretty good clip still, but not like laser focused speed. So at the end of 18 months, you're 30 years old. Okay, you got another 50 plus years to live and maintain these results. So if your only goal is to maintain those results, well, then you still have to be growing because you know, you're going to lose one to 3% per year after a certain time of your life anyways. So it's, that's the hardest part. Like I get these people for such a short period of time and I'm trying to pour into them as much as I can, because having been overweight for my entire life until I figured it out, losing weight was never the problem. I, I had lost multiple times. I had lost over 70 pounds, one time over a hundred pounds and I gained it all back plus some. And I, that happened between the ages of 14 and about 22 years old. I had gained and lost about 70 to 80 pounds every year and a half or so. Just lose 70, up 80. Lose 80, up 90. Lose 90, up 110. Lose 110, up 140. And I'm now up to 420 pounds. And then I lose 100 pounds in three months. And... I'm looking at it and I'm stuck already. I'm down at a 300 pounds again. And I'm like, well, what do I do? Like, I don't know what to do. So I just started changing one little thing at a time. It was like, okay, well, what happens if I just do this for a couple of weeks and then boom, drop, drop 10 pounds, kind of hit a little plateau again. Well, what happens if I change this now, change this now? And that's what I'm trying to get through to people is like this, this concept of like, it's not like you need to overhaul the whole thing, but you could just have one area that's out of balance and just, it's all about just trying to keep all the, keep it all together and headed in the same direction and not let something shoot off in the wrong place. Because that's really when we go back to those old habits and especially it's so easy. Like it's so much easier for me to stop by Casey's and grab a donut than to like not grab a donut. I know that sounds weird, but if I got to walk in there, to grab a monster or something because I'm on, you know, driving, driving to wherever and I want to stop and get a monster and that donut case is calling me. I feel that call still like I, <laughs> it's not like it goes away. So I have to have strategies in place to avoid things like that. And that's what I try to teach people is like, how can we avoid the donut case? But not, and it's not like the donuts are bad, but it's like, well, if you, if you can't, have one beer you probably shouldn't drink beer like if you can't go out with a friend and have just a beer because you're struggling with alcoholism it's no different than hey i probably shouldn't have one donut if i if i'm gonna end up eating a donut every day for the next month right 100 so, percent. it's always those little changes and i love yeah. what you said earlier about just kind of starting from somewhere you know not starting off with going you know, seven days a week and doing two hours of cardio and like all this crazy stuff like some people try to do, like especially like New Year's resolution. You see people, I'm going to go to the gym every single day, you know, for seven days a week and I'm going to do yeah. two works, two workouts a day. And I'm like, what? I'm like, you're not even yeah. doing anything right now. How are you going to do that? Yeah. So it, it, it is good to take that approach to just start small. Like when I got back into my because I I got sick with lupus. Um. So that was oh, January, January of 2020 was when I uh, got diagnosed. And after that, I wanted to get back into working out because I'm like, maybe that'll help a little bit with, you know, what I'm yeah. dealing with. And now that I'm on medication, I feel like I have the energy that I could at least go to the gym because at, at that time, I, I was pretty much at home all the time if I wasn't at work I was just at home <laughs> and a lot of times yeah. I would work from home because I couldn't you know I wasn't well enough to go to work but um it got to the point where I was like yeah I just want to go to the gym like I don't even need to work out like let me just go there and that's step one like <laughs> Just yeah. walk in, just walk into the place and look around and that's it and and what I did was I got on the treadmill and I went I think 10 minutes and then I left and I'm like, well, Hey, I did something, you know, it's right. better than nothing. Yeah. Um, and then one thing led to another and over time I got back into <clears throat> my routine. And then, I mean, I look at back then versus now, like how much progress I made. It's insane. 
So yeah. it's good to start small. It, it's hard because you're like, I want to see the results right now, but you got to remind yourself that you're not going to see the results if you try to rush the results. The results might come, yeah. but then you might get injured. You might get sick or you might get off track. You might get out of your routine. So it's always better to just slowly build those habits and, you know, make, make little changes that are manageable. Yeah. Um, I agree a hundred percent. And like, there's a, what I've learned is there's a tipping point for people. So someone has to see enough progress that it motivates them enough to show up the next day. And then eventually you don't need motivation because you built discipline. Your motivation disappears. And I'm just, I'm now just doing this because it's part of my life. It's a discipline that I have. But if you do too much, you're going to see insane results and the risk of burnout on the back end is there. If you don't do enough because you're just, well, I'm just testing the waters. I'm just dipping my toe in. Well, then you're not going to see the results that you want. And then you're going to go back to doing the old thing. So you have to find this nice little place in the middle where it's like, I'm pushing myself up to the edge, but not over it. And I'm also seeing the results that I want to see, but like it's sustainable results. And that is a hard place to find. And that's where like, that's where I try to come in and help clients is like, let's find that happy medium of like moderately aggressive. So I can give you the aggressive plan if you want it. I'll give you a plan that you'll lose a crap ton of weight super fast. But unless you're, this is where it's hard. Cause it's like, I did something, but I'm telling my clients, sorry, I don't think you're capable of doing this. And it's not cause like I'm trying to be mean, but it's like, Hey, don't eat for the next 60 days, liquids only. I thought I was addicted to food. So that's why I did that. So I didn't eat for 60 days and just drink fruit juice because I said, well, if I was trying to kick drugs, I would need to stay away from drugs. And food is basically my drug. So I need to still survive. So I was like, so what if I don't give myself food, but I still give myself nutrition? Saw this documentary, tried it, it worked. And that gave me crazy results. Like I said, it I ended up doing something before that. that I lost 40 pounds in about 30 days. Now, when you're 420 pounds, losing 40 pounds in 30 days isn't that crazy because half of it's water weight anyways, just from eating garbage for half my life. So it's just, uh, I think people need to realize that if it took you 10 years to gain 50, 60 pounds, then 10 months is a pretty good bargain, right? Like 10 years for 10 months. I, I would trade that. You would trade it for a salary. Like if someone says, I'll pay you out the next 10 years, of your salary over the next 10 months, as long as you put in a lot of hard work, you're like done. I'm, I'm now nine and a half years ahead of my schedule. So I think it's just um, everything's so now, 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 now that, something like weight loss, which there isn't a now, now thing. Even if you go in and get gastric bypass, or you start using like a GLP one agonist, like uh, uh semaglutide is I think what its common name is, but Ozempic has been getting really popular and we go those aren't going to, you don't lose the weight overnight. You still got to put in months of work. Uh, yeah. And it's, it makes me sad because I think people quit on themselves before they even get started. Um, and I did that. So I know it and I can see it, you know, a fisherman always spots a fisherman from afar. And when I see somebody who's struggling with it, I'm, I'm like, if I could just really get in your head for about five minutes and change a little wiring here, I think you'd be good. Yeah. It, I'm really glad to hear you say that too, because there is so much of the marketing in weight loss that is directed to that, where it's like, do it fast, do it now. And I really would like to see more of what you're talking about of like, hey, this is actually going to get you the results that will last with you for a lifetime, not just right now. And then you go back to your old ways and then you got to do it all over again, because that's yeah. really what happens a lot of times with people. And and I'm not necessarily an expert on weight loss, especially not to like over 50 pounds. Um, so it's not really like my expertise. I'm more of like building muscle, kind of you know, getting toned, if you will. <laughs> yeah. But um, but it it's so interesting to me, just like 
hearing you talk about that and then versus like a lot of the marketing that I see on it and especially on YouTube, like if you look up weight loss on YouTube, it's all like right now in 60 days and 30 days in one week. And I'm like, one week? <laughs> what are you talking yeah. about? <laughs> like you're not going to change your life in a week. But yeah. um, yeah, I just, it makes me happy that there are people like you <laughs> that are doing it the right way uh, and spreading the right information out there. I'm trying. And that's, that's <laughs> the other part of it is like, I am just trying. I don't have this all figured out and I don't have it all perfect, but I am constantly trying to improve on what I do because I, when I first started trying to do this, make a business of it, I didn't know where to turn. So what did I do? I went online and I, I looked to the people who are doing it and I'm f- trying to figure out what are they doing. Then I hire a coach to help me and me and this coach don't see it eye to eye because everything for him is a dollar sign. So all he cares about is the dollar sign, dollar sign, dollar sign. And I talked to him and I'm just like, Hey, I don't care if I make money, if I'm not giving my clients results, like, and I don't think people understand that like when you have 50 plus pounds to lose, it's like having like a, it's like having a compound fracture in your leg and they're going to have to cut you open and they're going to have to damage tissue to get through to that bone so that they can then fuse it back together and then basically glue that all, you know, sew it all back together. And it's like you sometimes have to unravel parts of your life and do some damage to areas of your life in order to fix them. And that's a really hard concept for people to grasp is that it's going to get worse before it gets better. It's not like, OK, I started working out cured. No, like you're going to put yourself through hell for a couple of weeks while this, while you're fighting your body's and your brain's response of like, Hey, we're, we don't like this. And getting past that hump is incredibly difficult. But when you hire someone like online, you should hopefully be able to trust that they're going to give you that. And you're not just a dollar sign to them. And that's been a huge focus of like what I've tried to do is, I just need to make enough money to pay my bills and I need you to lose weight, but I can't want it more than you want it. So I need, I need to somehow reach to you of like, I need you to want this real bad. So by any means necessary, I will figure it out for someone. 100%. And I think that is kind of what separates um, good coaches from average coaches is finding out the why and helping people actually dig deep and find out like why do you want to lose the weight you know what is really driving you because if their drive and their motivation behind it isn't strong enough then the likelihood that they're going to adhere to it and actually want to put in the effort is a lot lower so finding finding out what is the driving force behind it is so important and i feel like that's what a lot of coaches maybe miss sometimes and they're just so focused on the money that they're not focusing on actually getting to the client's pain points. And I just, I see a lot of that sometimes. Um, And there's a lot of great coaches out there, but there's certainly a lot of (laughs) bad ones too, (laughs) like every industry, but uh, it's just, yeah, it sometimes is frustrating to see the focus being so much on the money. And I see that a lot in, I even see it too with like, I don't know if you see this, you probably do because you're in the space, but it's like, there's so many fitness coach coaches. You know what I'm talking yeah. about? Like, where I hired one. <laughs> I fell victim to it too. Cost like, me, uh, cost me $26,000. Yeah. They're going to coach you on how to be a coach, but it seems like there's more fitness coach coaches than actual coaches. I'm like, how is this possible? Few. Yeah, um, there's quite a few in the space, right? And it's because everyone wants to tell you how to make money. Everyone's got their strategy on how you how you make money in this space. And it's like, how about we learn how to affect people in a positive way first before yeah. we go try to make money? Like, I I never wanted to do this at all. Like, and that's why it's really challenging at times because I quit my job at a law firm. And like, I had just taken the LSAT and I was applying to law schools and I'm going down this path and then I lose 184 pounds 
And I'm thinking to myself, the whole reason I wanted to go to law school was to help people. Like I can help people with things if I know the law. And if I, I can, if I know the law, I can help people get what they need legally, whatever, whatever it be. Like I was interested in all areas of law, but that then went by the wayside when I realized like, this is much more important. What happened to me, the change that happened with me is way more important. And if I can help people with this, this is a way higher calling to my life than legal crap. Like, I don't want to help you get money for your car accident. If I can help you fix your life, like your actual life. So when I see people that are like, and part of it is being in Facebook groups that are like associated with personal trainers. And I see what they talk about and I see what they're interested in. It breaks my heart a little bit because the way I see them talk about their clients at times, and I'm not saying this to disparage them, but more of if you're a personal trainer out there and you're watching this, your client is more important than your paycheck. You work for them. Like they don't, you know, you work for them. And if it's not working, Find something that works for them. Don't just be like, oh, well, you're not following the program. Why aren't they following the program? What's going on in their life? And no one asks the why. And that's something you said that it, the why is the biggest part. Like when you had lupus, lupus is an autoimmune disorder that attacks your joints, correct? Yeah, it attacks everything. Um, but the everything. joint pain is probably I would say the fatigue is like the number one symptom and the joint pain's like right there, number two. Yeah. Um, at least some, in my experience. One of the weird uh, side note, I found out that like they use black widow venom in some of the treatments for lupus. Some people really? like yeah, like they've synthesized what? some chemical that's from black widow venom in lupus. Maybe I'm wrong. It could be a different autoimmune disorder, but <laughs> I'll have to look it up. Um but when you when you are experiencing fatigue and you're experiencing joint pain, Western medicine says face value problem, face value solution. Let's take some Tylenol. Let's take some NSAIDs. Um, why don't you, you know, quit eating gluten Steroids. in the morning? Yeah, let's <laughs> let's put you on methyltrexate. Let's let's put you on these crazy things and let's solve the face value problem. But that then doesn't work and then the doctor finally asks why and it's like why should be our first thing why why is she experiencing joint pain she's a young girl she works out she's fit she doesn't eat like crap so why why does she have all this joint pain and fatigue well let's run some blood tests let's ask why right away people don't ask the why and then they're stuck in this pattern for months and months and months and that just creates a whole nother problem up top because then you think you're unfixable you think it's not solvable. 100%. And it, hurts me. it really does. And I feel like there is uh, maybe more of a need for um, people who know how to deal with people who have maybe more obstacles than your average person. Uh, like for you, you're dealing with people who they need to lose a lot of weight. You know, they're very overweight. And then for me, um, like I've always found it difficult to train at gyms um and them understand my illness and how my approach to the training may be a little bit different than everybody else and that's why i think i like working out by myself because i have to take a unique approach to it i can't necessarily always do <laughs> what everybody else is doing i can't do 90 minute cardio sessions i can't like i would I'd be recovering for a week. So it's yeah. like I have to slowly build on a lot of things. And that's why sometimes group exercise is tough for me because I'll like feel like I'm a quitter, you know, if I have to like stop, you know, maybe like a little bit early or like whenever I was sparring, sometimes I'd have to like sit out for a round because I'm like, I, I need a second. <laughs> like, um, yeah. And so I feel like there is a little bit more of a need for that now because so many people now have autoimmune disease so many people are overweight but we are catering to like the small percentage of people who don't have any issues and we're acting like it's their fault that they're not adhering to their diet their program whatever it is and it's like wait a second <laughs> yeah. we've got a little bit more obstacles to work with than your average person so maybe let's kind of yeah. take a different approach and slow it down and give people, you know, maybe a little bit of leeway so that way they don't burn out and quit because <laughs> that's what's going to exactly. happen. Exactly. 
Yeah, like if if you hired a personal trainer and they put you on trainer eyes and they put all your workouts on there and you're going through them and then you miss a day and maybe you miss another day and a few, you know, over the three month period, you end up missing like 25% of the workouts and they told you, well, if you just do what I tell you to do, you'll get these results. (laughs) And at the end, you're nowhere near it. And then they start pointing the finger back at you like, well, you missed all your workouts. You missed 25% of this. You didn't do your cardio on these days. And it's like, yeah, I have lupus. I have bad days. <laughs> right. You didn't care to ask, you know, and you didn't care to help me because what they're trying to teach a lot of personal trainers is sell one program, sell one program for one type of person. And I get that, um, but it can't be a fully built vehicle. Like it can't be a fully built program. It's got to be the bones. So like how I explain it to people is I sell a Tesla. You can get it painted whatever color you want. You can get your own custom interior. You can choose the the sound package you want for it. But at the end of the day, I sell one car and it's a one program designed to help one type of person solve a problem. And we work everything out in the details of how to make it fit for you. But it's no way it, it because if it's so rigid that it can't be bent, then it's already broken. So I have to create it with some flexibility in there that people understand, like you can still see results, but they're just not going to look the same as they would if you were doing it by the number, by the letter. Um, But that's okay because not everyone needs to see 10 pounds a month for progress. Some people just need five. Some people need 15. That's another reality check that you have to give people sometimes is like, I love what you want. I love that you want to lose 50 pounds in the next two months. Likelihood of that happening, very little. Like the app, uh, we kind of, I kind of mentioned semi-glutide earlier. In the main study that they use for showing that it's effective for weight loss, the average participant only lost 5% of their body mass over 28 weeks. 5% of your body mass over 28 weeks is essentially five pounds. If you weighed a hundred pounds, it's only losing five pounds in almost six months. And I look at that and I'm like, and that was considered exceptional results. Like (laughs) if I charged as much as they charge for this semi-glutide for these people to take these injections, hundreds of dollars a month. Well, I'm promising them double to triple that weight loss in like half the time. So you know, I think that we want the quick fix. We want the quick cure and that's fine. But putting in the work is really, that's, what's going to get you those sustainable results rather than like anything else. I'm sorry. I kind of bounced all over the place there. <laughs> no, but you're hundred percent right. I mean, I feel like a lot of times when people ask me questions, I mean, I feel like it's starting to get better, but a lot of times when people have asked me questions about, fitness and workouts and diet and stuff like that a lot of people are like the first question is usually like what supplements are you taking and i'm like do you think the supplements are the reason why i'm in shape i'm like no i'm like yes i do take supplements i take protein i take creatine and sometimes i use pre-workout i'm like that's all i take i'm like i don't need anything else because I mean, there are other supplements out there. Like sometimes I'll do like an intro workout or something like that. And there are supplements out there that are great um, and they can help you kind of optimize a little bit, but you don't need any supplements. That's why they're called supplements. Um, You don't need them. It's just sometimes I feel like a lot of people think they are that quick fix and they see people taking supplements and they're like, oh, that must be why they're they look like that. That must be why they lost all that weight. That must be why they built all that muscle. And it's such a huge misconception sometimes because it's like, yeah, yeah. just taking uh, a certain protein powder is not going to guarantee <laughs> guarantee your results. It's all the other work that you don't see that they're putting in that is getting them those results. And it's not even like you have to work out you know, every single day or crazy amount. That's another yeah. thing I feel like is a huge misconception is – you can work out like two, three days a week and still get good results. Yeah. But be consistent about that two, three days if you're going to do it. I think that is consistency, discipline, however you want to say it. Like that is the, that is the truth of it all is if you're just consistent enough, you're going to see results, but 
that means going in and putting in the same effort all the time. Like not, oh, I'm having a bad day at work, so I'm going to go half-ass some cardio. No, get in there and do your workout. I promise you, you're going to feel better afterwards and give it everything you got. Give it 110% if you have to, like, but be consistent, whether you're doing three days or seven days or twice a day, whatever you're doing. That's the only way you're going to see results. You can't. What I tell people is one bad day of eating might wipe out a week or two of good work because you could be in a calorie excess in one day that could wipe out two weeks of deficit. That's pretty easy. Um, I know I've done that where I've done like a 10 or 12,000 calorie day and wiped out, you know, a 6,000 calorie deficit plus some in just a matter of days. But if you're consistent for weeks and months at a time, a couple bad days aren't going to do crap to that. It It's just putting WWW, putting all those wins, stacking them up in a row, that loss category, like, you know, I, I it's not going to be significant in the long run, but if it's all about now, what am I seeing now in this moment? Well, you're never going to get to the end. And if it's all about the end, well, you're never going to be able to take the first step because you can't see what's right in front of you. So it's, that's kind of that balance of like, have the idea, but focus on the first step. And if you're so focused on the first step that you can't see the, you know, you're missing the forest for the tree, then like, that's where having someone like a counselor, therapy, or a friend that knows what they're doing is really, or even hiring a coach and paying someone to be accountable with you is like really important because we're, we're social creatures. We need people. And it's best to go talk to someone who you would trade places with, you know, like that. I envy that person's life. I'm going to go ask them for advice. Envy isn't always a bad thing, by the way. I don't mean it <laughs> like envy to the point of jealousy. I just mean it right. like you look at someone and you go that I would trade places with them at face value. Well then ask them for advice and then you do some research on the advice they gave you. Don't just instantly go, okay, I'm doing this. Right. hundred percent. Yeah. That's important too. And I feel like as a coach, it is important to be kind of practicing what you preach a little bit. I mean, obviously you don't have to be doing the same programs you're giving your clients because your clients have different needs than you do. But the fact that, you know, you're you're still putting in the work with your nutrition, you're being consistent with your fitness, and even just like your your mental as well, and just having a good mindset about it. And um, it's gonna be hard for your clients to stay positive if you're not even staying positive with yourself in your own journey. So I think, yeah, that that's another thing too, is like kind of leading from the front and showing um showing people an example that they can look yeah. to and, and say, okay, well, this person did it and they have, you know, the life, the physique, whatever it is that I want. So if I kind of allow them to coach me and give me some advice, then maybe I will get a similar result. You're not going to get the same results because everybody's yeah. body is different. <laughs> Everybody is different, but you might get similar results and you might actually sometimes figure out that maybe that isn't what you wanted. Maybe you want something else. And sometimes that happens a lot too. Like when I was younger, um, and I think a lot of women experience this when they're in their teenage years, but like, I always wanted to be skinny. Like I was obsessed with like just being skinny. Like I wanted to be under a hundred pounds. Like it was like wow. always like, and I'm pretty small. I'm only five one. So for me, like I, I mean, I was pretty skinny when I was like around 95, I think was the lowest I ever got. Uh, I was pretty skinny, but I wasn't yeah. like, I didn't look like unhealthy or anything, but I didn't feel healthy and I didn't feel confident even when I was that light, I guess you could say. And I was yeah. pretty young. I was like 15, 16 when I was that light. Um, and I was also on ADHD medication, which <laughs> makes it really easy to lose weight. <laughs> yeah. Um, not in a healthy way, but it does make you lose weight. So I feel like it kind of almost gave me a little bit of like a body dysmorphia of no matter how skinny I got, I never felt like I was skinnier than the girl on TV or the girl in my class or whatever it is. And I was always comparing myself. And it wasn't until probably a few years ago that I really got confident with my body and how not even just how I look, but also how I feel. 
And it was when I started to gain weight that I got that confidence because I was gaining muscle and I just kind of felt more energy. I felt healthier. And I was like, oh, maybe I was too skinny before. And I just didn't realize it because I thought you had to be that skinny. I thought that was what the goal was, you know, for every woman to be skinny. And I don't know. I think that change was really insightful for me because I think that happens to a lot of people. Like I've talked to other women who they started off wanting to lose weight. They do all this cardio that, you know, they do the whole thing. Yeah. And I did the whole thing. I All I did was cardio for like years until a few years ago is when I really started weightlifting and I'll talk to these women they're like yeah I thought I wanted to lose weight but then I started weight training and now I actually like want to get bigger <laughs> yeah. and it's so cool to see that and see more women like lifting weights and doing like bodybuilding style workouts because you realize that you're not gonna get bulky or whatever you want to call it like you're not going to yeah. look like too masculine or whatever everybody says you're not going to look like that just from lifting weights like the people that have that appearance I guess you could say like female bodybuilders like they're taking things to look like that so a good <laughs> amount of them are on some 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 sauce <laughs> yeah it's actually kind of crazy like I never really thought about females with like the um peds and steroids and stuff like that i never really it just never really was a thing until like now yeah. female bodybuilding started getting more popular and i just never really put two and two together and then i just kind of realized like oh my gosh there's a lot of women that are taking stuff yeah. now and and i don't really yeah. have an opinion on it necessarily because i don't feel like i i'm qualified enough to really even talk about <laughs> Yeah. I kind of know more about it on like the MMA side just from watching MMA yeah. but it is interesting how that is changing just kind of what images we're seeing and there's so many different body types but there's so many um so many dangers sometimes with the internet and body dysmorphia and mm -hmm. even just with yourself even without the internet <laughs> Like it's yeah. still like you look in the mirror sometimes you're just like eh like I even still have like every once in a while I have a day where I look in the mirror I'm like I'm like eh, I don't know I have this little fat here or this here like you know I pick myself yeah. apart sometimes and I feel like sometimes the internet is really good in a way where we are promoting other body types and we're not saying like oh you have to look like this like everybody's different everybody has you know their own um, journey and their own body type and whatever but sometimes I see things and it's like okay are we really promoting this right now <laughs> like are we really yeah. trying to push this on people that you have to look like this or that um I don't know it I feel like it's getting better and it's getting worse at the same time and <laughs> I don't know how that is but it's definitely something that um, used to be a real struggle for me. And I think can be a real struggle for a lot of people if they don't um, have a good relationship with their body image. And um, yeah. if they get sucked into all that, it, it can be hard to dig yourself out of it. Absolutely. And it's you, you hit the nail on the head there. I think it was uh, Theodore Roosevelt said that, you know, comparison is the thief of joy. You, it's so hard to enjoy the progress you're making if you're always comparing it to somebody else or what somebody else has. Like your, your perfectly running car does not seem as great as your neighbor's Maserati. Well, yeah, it's not, but why, like, why does that matter? And it's one thing that I've, I've learned is that people, people, including myself, like when we don't have a story that is our story, we will go and follow someone else's story. Like we'll go and try to make that story our story. And one thing I start with, with all my clients is I make them almost do like a vision board, but not really a vision board. I just ask them to imagine if they actually got to write their life story. How does it end? What are they doing? Where are they going? What people are they hanging out with? What do they look like? What do they feel like? And I asked them to get really creative, like as if they were an author. And this is harder for some people than others, but 
a lot of the time people just fail to take the time and ask themselves what they truly want. And then they'll go and follow another person's story and be like, well, this person wants that. So I'm going to try to want it too. Well, then you're already starting from a place of comparison. And because you have no vision for what you want, you have no desire. And because you don't have your own desires, you're just going after what the world offers for things to envy, things to desire, things to want the BBL or, you know, the six pack abs or all this stuff. And it's like, but you may not need that. Like, if you just need something that you're happy about and women get hit with it way harder than men, because like, this is going to sound weird. It's like more socially acceptable for a guy to be fat than a girl to be fat. It seems like at least in America, <laughs> it's treated that way. Like, and like, if a guy's fat, you just look at him and you're like, whatever, another fat guy. Um, <laughs> but like, if a girl's fat, it's like, well, like, it's like, she's crucified for it. And, yeah. You know, there's a lot of other things that go into that too that I've learned especially with my wife and her just having a kid like when women get pregnant, it's like the equivalent of a guy going on steroids for months, like nine and a half months. It's like you are just injecting yourself with 250 milligrams of test every three days. That's like what's happening with these women. Their bodies are going on crazy levels of hormones in order to produce this life and then everything shuts down. So it's like having no post cycle therapy either after being on this crazy high level of testosterone as a guy and like they're just expected to bounce back on top of that like women's hormone levels directly affect all of their natural cycles like too much fat shuts off you know too much leptin in the blood can cause picos type stuff also too little leptin in the blood shuts off the menstrual cycle completely so then it's all this of like this internalization of like imagery, you know, I don't look the way that, you know, I want to look. And it's like, well, why do you want to look that way? You know, what do you actually want? And for men, it's, it's more, it comes down to less in their physical appearance and more to how they feel about themselves as a man, you know? Um, like, do I feel like a man? Do I feel like I'm capable of protecting and providing for my family? And even if you're not a married man, at the end of the day, that's still subconsciously more than likely driving a lot of the actions is that preparation of a family or that pursuit of a family, um, that pursuit of protection and provision for somebody. And I would really just challenge all of my clients and anyone listening to this, like if you're if you're struggling with like getting something going, making a change, maybe go back to the drawing board and figure out just like what you were saying, is this really what I want? Or is this just something that I has been shown to me and modeled to me that I'm going after because, well, that's what I've seen. Like, what do you actually want? And then work backwards from there. Like, how do I get there step by step? Like, with that vision in mind, how can I just take a little step every day that gets me closer to that? That's um, a big part of that is feeling that you deserve it. So, like, you have the desire for change, but you have to believe that you deserve it. And that People have gotten themselves, and I know I did for such a long time, get myself to a point where because I disappointed myself for so long, I don't feel like I deserve it anymore. I don't deserve to be happy. Like, I don't deserve to lose the weight. And it's like, but you do. Like, you're no different than me, and I deserve it. So if I deserve it, you deserve it. There's nothing that you could have done that you don't deserve to be happy. Um outside of like committing some heinous crime don't you don't deserve <laughs> to be happy heinous crime committers but 100 I, I just really want people to understand their value and i think a lot of it comes back to like figuring out who you want to be because that's why you're valuable not because you have a great ass or because you have flat abs like that doesn't make you great the person underneath that and figuring out that deep desire of like, if that's what you want, like if you want to, if your big dream is to go to the beach when you're 60 and have a bunch of guys staring at you or a bunch of girls staring at you, then yeah, by all means keep chasing it. But more than likely you have something you want more than just good looks. Absolutely. Absolutely. And for me, like even when I started, I was just trying to get healthy again. Like, I mean, when I originally started working out, I just felt like, I should probably work out a little bit just, you know, to make sure I don't like die. 
<laughs> just make sure I, like, you know do something or like just try a little bit you know i didn't do much but i would like run yeah. every every other day or whatever it was but the last time that i kind of like got back into my routine after the lupus thing um it was because i wanted to get my health back on track and then as a result of that as a byproduct was the aesthetic part of it and i'm like oh i look better now cool but that wasn't what I was really concerned about from the beginning. I was yeah. concerned about my health and and just kind of trying to get rid of a lot of that joint pain by strengthening my muscles and just strengthening my body in general. I'm like, well, if I'm stronger, I'll probably have less pain and be less likely to get injured and things like that. And so that was really my goal. And then everything else is just, yeah, it's a, it's a byproduct. And you have to focus on those more long-term things I feel like in order to make real progress because if you just focus on oh I want to get a big butt or oh I want to get abs if you just focus on that once you get there the motivation is just going to be gone and then you're not going to be able to maintain it um or you're just not going to be motivated enough in general because looks really isn't enough to motivate you to be consistent in the gym three to five to seven days a week or whatever it is, it's not enough to motivate you a lot of times. Yeah. Plus, by the time you get that big juicy booty anyways, it might be out of style again. You know, <laughs> the Kardashians might not be around and we're going back to pancake butts. 100%. So, it's like, a trend. I think a lot of, yeah, like trend. in all honesty, like that's, that's a lot of what it is. Like there was a period in time, like there's girls that are all into the dad bods now. And like, where it's like, I look like I'm not fat, but I look like I also drink a six pack every week. So (laughs) I think that like, that's why you got to do what you want. Like, and it has to be objective in, into how you feel that's like measurable in some way, because if it's all just based on this subjective feeling of like, well, I feel better. It's like, well, there has to be something measurable so that you know what you're doing is like, you know how to replicate it. It's not just random. And people are so used to feeling bad that they don't even realize how unwell their bodies are. Like when you're, when you feel like crap all the time, it's really hard to recognize that you feel like crap because it's like, oh, I just feel normal. But as soon as you start doing something about it, you feel worse for a few days. You know, like you don't eat breakfast seven seven days a week. But as soon as you tell yourself you're doing intermittent fasting, you're hungry at 9 a.m. Um, so it's like it doesn't make any sense. But it's because it's going to your brain now knows it's part of the game and it's it gets a little bit off. But you're so used to feeling bad that it's like you won't let yourself feel better. And that, that is something that really bums me out um, because I fell into it for so long. It's like, I wouldn't allow myself to feel better. And that's where I see a lot of other people. It's like, they won't allow themselves to forgive themselves for how they got there and be able to move forward and be like, yeah, I got myself to a really bad place, but I deserve to feel better. And I want to feel better. And doing it for you not because you think someone's going to like you more or you're going to have a better chance of like meeting a chick at the club or you know finding a husband whatever it's it is um it's just hard it's it's hard people we're complicated creatures and there's a lot that goes into it more than just someone's fat or someone's skinny and they want to gain weight or lose weight respectively like it still comes back to that why Hundred percent. And as we sit here, all I'm thinking is the whys. Exactly, and and finding the why is so important, and sometimes it's hard. Um, but it, it's it's definitely you have to. Otherwise, it's going to be really hard for you <laughs> to to get yourself up in the morning and go to the gym and you know do all the right things and not get not order the pizza. And all that stuff, yeah. it, it makes it a lot more difficult when you don't have a strong why. So I'm glad, I'm glad we talked about that. Um, yeah. We'll wrap this up here soon, but yeah, um, I want to ask you a couple questions before you go. Absolutely. Um, nothing like it's not a test. Uh, <laughs> what well, is your... if it is? <laughs> Getting my Google ready. <laughs> what is your favorite? I guess 
one of your favorite exercises to do? Not like workouts, but like one of your favorite exercises. Um, I personally love the hack squat machine and I like specifically using it in the reverse, like Instagram chick, butt influencer way where you, you go forward into it and you do like the straight leg deadlifts with the hip hinge. For me, I do not get a better workout than doing that exercise. And I legitimately love it. Um, I also really, really enjoy, um, shoulder laterals <laughs> because it is the worst burn to the point where it's like, I would rather someone cut my arms off. So then, then keep going. And I, I like those type of things that are like miserable workouts because I, they they're always the most rewarding the most miserable workouts are always most rewarding for me and those two shoulder laterals and the reverse straight leg deadlift on the hack squat i guess you could say just think instagram influencer um those are my favorites i love that yeah lateral raises oh my god that's like my favorite part of a workout is if i have lateral raises at the end and like those last few reps and I just get the best pump. And then you look in the mirror, your shoulders are all you know, oh, yeah. <laughs> bumped up and you're like, yes, you just yeah. feel so good. And you don't even have to use that much weight. Like you, oh. I, I get a burn just from doing uh, 10 pounds. Um, I get a crazy burn for 10 pounds and I'm yeah. six foot five. Like, <laughs> and I'm like, it's still a good workout. 100%. Okay. You and ever, then my next, uh, go real ahead. Real quick. Do you ever do like a like a complete burnout with the laterals where you'll like start it like maybe like a 12 and you'll go down from 12 to 10 to 8 to 5 to whatever and you just basically go till yep. you can't even lift that's my favorite that the that best. right there is the shoulder lateral burnout number 1 100% yeah I, I actually have been doing a little bit more of that lately with like kind of doing I guess like more of like a drop set and mm. and going from like 10 and then i'll do fives at the end because by that point tens i can't even lift up <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna go to five <laughs> so i'm like let's go let's go and then those last few reps i'm just like oh my gosh hopefully i can lift my arm to be able to grab my steering wheel to get out of here <laughs> yeah seriously <laughs> okay so my next question is who is your favorite mma fighter doesn't have to be ufc but it probably will be, I'm guessing. <laughs> you know, this is where it gets hard because I like a lot of people for different reasons. Same. Like, as far as who I think is the most exciting fighter right now in the UFC and one of my favorite people to watch, I love watching Alexander Volkanovsky because he he's like the white mighty mouse. And I miss Demetrius Johnson being in the UFC. He was a great one to watch. But... At the same time, I will never not pay and never not tune in for a John Jones fight because the story is too big with him. Like he's had so many issues off of out of the octagon that I understand he's a very polarizing person, but his only loss was a disqualification based on a stupid rule, like a 12 to 6 yeah. elbow. It, it, that fight should have been stopped three minutes prior to him dropping that elbow when he had the guy in top mount and just beat the piss out of him for <laughs> five minutes. So I, I'd have to say John Jones just because I he is he is the Michael Jordan he is the greatest of UFC fighters with, currently and I don't know it's hard the problem with labeling someone like a Jordan is. Well, then everyone who comes after him is going to be compared to Jordan. It's like, no, just let John Jones be John Jones. Yes. And then everyone else is themselves. But he's. I, I want more from him. Like I was left at the end of that serial fight. Like, that's it. That's all I got. I waited three years for that. OK, I'll wait till July. <laughs> yes. And it's so hard to really pick like who's the greatest fighter of all time. Like if you look at it just like on paper, it's obviously John Jones. Um, but I think there are like certain fighters who just like at their prime, like it was the Anderson Silva era era oh my gosh. or it yeah. was the GSP era or it was, Seriously. you know, everybody has like their little era. So I feel like we need to appreciate like, instead of trying to say like, Oh, this, 
he's not the goat you're crazy like instead of having these like little debates about it it's like why don't we just appreciate all the amazing fighters that have yeah. made incredible careers and all have done things in kind of a different way too like habib like he had probably the most impeccable career of just yeah. i don't did he ever lose a round maybe one um <laughs> maybe one maybe two, one or two I, maybe <laughs> but like it's uh, but like barely especially yeah and especially <laughs> that how crazy that lightweight division was and he ran through everybody everyone like that that's what was so impressive about jones is because they yes. threw a lot of killers at him in that light heavyweight division and he ran through all of them there was a few fights that maybe he they they you could argue that it could have gone either way, but hey, he's that. That's to me. I respect talent, and that I don't care if you're the most annoying person off of the octagon, or if you're a bad person. Like, if you have talent, I'm all for it because that's what's beautiful. Like, I dislike Colby Covington. I do not like him as a human <laughs> being, and I know he's a heel and it's an act. Like he pulls the chael son in, but. He's got a gas tank, and to be honest, like everyone's throwing a fit right now about him potentially having to fight Leon, or Leon having to fight him, and it's like he has already dominated everybody in the division except Usman, and now Usman's lost twice in a row. So give yep. him the shot. Like it doesn't matter if he hasn't fought in a year and a half. There's been no reason for him to fight unless he needed money. Hundred percent, and like I think pretty much everybody dislikes Colby as. <laughs> Colby the MMA fighter but Colby as a person I think I think if we could kind of see more of that then it would pro like people would probably not be so angry when he gets fights or if he gets the title fight <laughs> I think yeah. um that's like his biggest thing but at the same time that's how he sells fights and he does he's right? so good at selling fights and Yes. I think honestly, Leon would make a huge mistake if he didn't take that fight because he's probably going to make more money on that fight than he did with Usman. Uh, yes. it, I mean, there's such a good story behind it. It's just, it's great. I love the fight. I love it. And it's yeah. a striker versus a wrestler. Like, it's just, it's perfect. Yeah. I don't know why everybody doesn't want to see this fight. <laughs> Seriously. But yeah. Um, I guess to get back to the question, Jones is currently and probably will forever be who I say is my favorite, but I also, I enjoy other people for who they are. I enjoy Conor McGregor yeah. for being Conor McGregor. <laughs> I think He's another character. Michael, <laughs> yeah, but also like Michael Chandler is so much fun to watch because yes. it's like he's here for a short time and that star is burning hot. Yes, Michael Chandler. Oh. And to think he had a whole career in Bellator before he even came to the UFC and exactly. fought a lot of UFC caliber fighters in Bellator, a lot of them who were in the UFC at one point. Yeah. And I know he hasn't exactly had the best luck since coming to the UFC. I mean, he's won how many fights? One or two, maybe? Uh, yeah. Or yeah, yeah, two. Uh, Dan Hooker and Tony Ferguson. I'm trying to remember if there's oh. one. I don't think oh, so. Yeah, I forgot kick. about the yeah. I forgot about the Tony for and Tony Ferguson. I think before that had never been finished, or at he least he's never, never been knocked he'd never been knocked out. Yeah, yeah. he might have been submitted before, but I don't think he'd ever been knocked out. Dude, it, oh the gosh. slow mo of that guy's face. Just, oh. And it sucks because like I hate seeing like somebody who used to be such a legend now see like them kind of decline it's like sad but then it's also like so exciting to see michael chandler get because i love all the fighters pretty much like there's not yeah. there's very few fighters there's fighters that like i don't like them as who they are as a person like yeah. connor don't necessarily love as a person john jones same thing but as a yeah. fighter i pretty much appreciate all of them and yeah. find a way to enjoy um you know all their different styles and talents and appreciate what they do because even just getting into that octagon is an accomplishment in itself and yeah. making it to the ufc like people don't understand how hard it is to get to the ufc it's so Seriously. hard so yeah. difficult yeah you there's not have a to lot be, of you either have to be like a master at one area 
like a master, like high level black belt in jujitsu or high level wrestler, like Penn State wrestler or Sambo specialist. Like you have to be a practitioner of one area or you have to train MMA for years, compete for probably years as well to even have a chance to make it to the UFC. It's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. You see these people come into the UFC with a 17 and two record. It's like, well, this guy's already had 19 professional fights <laughs> just to get into the UFC. Yeah. Like that's 19 times going out and risking somebody completely embarrassing you and you still show up and do it. Like, yep. That's why the UFC is a beautiful thing. All that, everything disappears when people step into the octagon and it's just two guys out there battling. And that's what's, and then at the end, I love, I love the sportsmanship. I love the crap talk too, but yeah. I also love that in UFC, two guys who hate each other can go up to each other for the most part after the fight and be like, all right, you whip my ass. I'll, I'll give you the nod. Like that was impressive. <laughs> or if it's like a really close fight too, just like that respect uh is so cool to see because i i think it is an interesting thing like um sometimes when i sparred if i had like a really good sparring session with somebody that i um sparred with more regularly then i feel like at the end like we would probably like give each other a hug or like just be like <laughs> fist bump like yeah that was good <laughs> yeah so i, I mean it. i can't imagine the feeling of like joanna versus uh why lee like after that fight i can't imagine just the feeling of like damn we really we really went after each other for for five rounds seriously <laughs> we left everything in that octagon it's, yeah. it's insane it, i have so much respect for fighters and even even just cutting weight like it's Ugh. it's just the whole thing is so difficult and uncomfortable and there's so many variables to it, so many aspects. And like, yes. not only are they a fighter, but they're also they gotta market themselves. They gotta do interviews. They gotta, yeah. um, build up hype. They gotta. I mean, there's so many things that they have to keep in mind and that they have to do. And I think that's why I appreciate even fighters that maybe a lot of people don't like or don't think are very good. Because I'm like, but even still, they're pretty good. <laughs> Yeah. And they're in the UFC. So, yeah. yeah. Definitely. They're very well, talented. Yeah, 100%. So much talent. Um, well, this has been great. I really appreciate talking to you and I've learned a lot from you <laughs> just in <laughs> the hour and a half or whatever it is that we've talked, but I appreciate you coming on, man. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, I really wasn't like when Nick tagged me in your post, I, <laughs> it wasn't like I was looking for opportunities to do this, but like I've been wanting to do stuff like this because this is how I get my thoughts out best is yes. a longer form conversation and just getting to know somebody and just seeing where the road travels. So I was really excited to do this and it makes me want to start one myself just to like, you should start talking. You I have do. a lot of knowledge. You on. should definitely. I will. I do one absolutely thank you though <laughs> this is really cool and like what are the chances that you want to talk about three things that i love talking about music <laughs> mma and exercise so i'm like this it's like i was supposed to like come chat with you i could talk mma for hours but oh 100 percent, me too i i could go on tangents but yeah that's why that's kind of why i started this and a lot of times when you are starting a podcast if you you know ask people about it and you talk to other people like hey i want to start a podcast what should i do a lot of times they'll tell you to pick a niche and i'm like dude i can't pick one thing that's just not me i have way too yeah. many different interests and I want to talk about all of them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I was like, I'm just going to start a podcast about MMA, fitness, music, all the things that I regularly talk about anyways, and just see what happens and see if people like it. I'm like, I don't know. And what I found is a lot of people that are into MMA are also into fitness and also into music. And a lot of people that are into fitness are also into music. And a lot of people that are into music, maybe they're not into fitness, but maybe they're curious about it. Or maybe they're curious about MMA. And so yeah. it's so fun. Like my my last guest was my best friend. Uh, <laughs> she's a therapist and she kind of just recently started her fitness journey. And so she 
she's not an MMA fan. You know, she's she's not really even like super, super into fitness like I am. But it was interesting to hear her perspective and hearing from an actual yeah. therapist, an expert on mental health about fitness was just totally interesting to me. And yeah. I think it's helpful for a lot of people to hear different perspectives on things. And I think that's what makes it so cool that I'm able to have different types of guests on and even just talk about different topics by myself because I do solo episodes too. But uh, it's so cool because you just, you get different perspectives on everything. Yeah. Well, I really appreciate you um, allowing me on like, and just letting, letting the conversation flow. You are a great host. Thank you. Thank you. I'm working on it. (laughs) I'm trying to get 1% better every single day. (laughs) Love it. Um, Awesome. Well, if you ever, if I end up doing something, I'll reach out to you. And if you ever need a quick fill for another spot, you just hit me up. Oh, absolutely. I'd love to have you on again. We'll have more fights to talk about. (laughs) For sure. Well, you have a great rest of your Sunday and hit me up if you ever need anything. If you ever um, have any questions, you want to come on the podcast again feel free to, to hit me up and I'll, I'll try to follow your, your journey until we uh, cross paths again and, and just kind of see yes, what ma'am. you're up to. So for sure. Awesome. Yeah, If you're ever up in the Lincoln County area, hit me up. We'll, you can come by and check out my gym. hundred percent. Awesome. Cool. Very cool. Well, Take you care. have a great day and I will talk to you again soon, my friend. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Bye. See ya. <laughs>